<laughs> Mike Frank, I don't know if you want this on the podium or if you want this. Thanks. That's nice good. Thank, thank you, sir. Hi. Well, hello, Story County. This is the first time I've stood up on stage as a candidate like this. So, uh, okay, well, let's wing it here. Um, first of all, I was told by a very dear friend, Richard Bender, who been involved in Iowa politics for some time too, to make mention to uh, Jan and <laughs> so look at she's hiding, she's hiding, uh, and and I saw Maddie Maddie a little bit ago. Uh, the coordination and uh, the representation that this chapter uh, does is uh, quite notable. I mean, it always runs all the way into Washington D.C. So BZ to this BZ is a Navy term. Sorry, try not to do that. Bravo Zulu. Uh, you can use that from now on in uh, Nevada. Um, so thank you for having me. Uh, I am um, I'm a fourth generation Iowan um, from Yo Yonder in Sioux County, hard up against the Rock River, uh, very rural, um, and you know it's that's the place where the red wave is over. And uh, so I emerged from that along with uh, I'm the youngest of nine. My mom was a one-room schoolhouse teacher. My dad came back from World War II and uh, uh, injured in the war and the like and uh, started a little implement repair business and that's where they lived and died. Um, I uh, had a great, great rural childhood, uh, the typical things you would do, and took off to Morningside College uh, and after about three weeks told my mom, you know, mom, I joined the Navy. <laughs> It took me, took me a few weeks. I was gone for 40 years, thereabouts, and uh, didn't, didn't know I was going to stay there quite that long. Um, those were good 40 years. Uh, first and foremost, what they taught me was the difference between good governance and less than good governance. I was a ship captain, um, a battle group commander, task force commander on the ground in Africa, lived on, lived on four different continents, moved 28 times, thank you very much. Um, spent time in Washington, D.C., um, studied, was a strategy person, a policy person, uh, worked across all denominations of people, across all walks of life, worked with every administration since the Carter administration, but not this one. So. Um, so I'm known as the guy that kind of makes tough decisions, and I'm happy to do that. Um, I've relied on the ability to discern what is the direction you should go, how to do it, how to find a compromising position, and when you need to be strong to find a no compromising but a win solution. Why am I running? Uh, I'm running to unseat the Trump era Republicans. So there's been some dishonesty in Washington, D.C., shocking as it may be. Having lived there uh, numerous times in my life, uh, from think tanks to, I worked for Ted Kennedy. Um, I was his first military legislative assistant. Um, and then he, he had one every year after that. Um, and it was, a, it, was a good, it was a good exposure to how a legislator, legislator ought to service on the Hill. He was the best for both sides of the aisle. Uh, we learned how to work across the aisle. It was, it was a matter of fact, um, daily evolution. Um, but what we didn't, but we, we didn't do was compromise our integrity. We didn't lie to ourselves on such matters as climate change. We didn't lie to ourselves with such matters as health care, such as some members who are on this hijacked airplane called Donald Trump's presidency. Um, we didn't lie to ourselves about um, how a little sliver of the economy won big as a result of special interest. What we learned was you had to be altruistic. You had to reach down for the, le the lesser of all of us and help them achieve the most they can do. Uh, education, fairness, 
the right to achieve the highest level you can and bring those around you up forward with you. Those were the Kennedy principles I learned. And those from, from other members of the Hill and also from the executive branches across government. It was, a val it was a valuable learning experience. So after 40 years, I came back here and um, live in Sioux City. Um, didn't come to Des Moines. Uh, that was my ancestral region. I wanted to stay there. And I'm very happy to, uh, to be a member of this race to unseat Joni Ernst. I think I will shine best if I answer questions, since um, I'm not so good about talking about myself yet. That's probably an attribute. So, yes, sir. Talk about okay, so um, I've penned approximately 27 international agreements in my time. And I can talk to you about what the Arabs say about it, and what the, what the Israelis say about it, and what the Russians say dealt with all of them. Um, but there's a manner to do trade negotiations, and what you do is you develop blocks, as in B-L-O-C. Um, the president wouldn't spell it that way. Um, and you certainly don't ostracize your friends. The question was about trade. Um, you corral your friends, like-minded individuals. You work deals. Now the deal is, it's ugly. Trade negotiations, international uh, negotiations are tough work. You lock yourself in rooms, you come out, you, you do near fisticuffs, you've got the experts in the room, not nuggets, as we say. Smart people whose job this is. Uh, who know the ins and outs, who know the numbers, uh, and you find a solution. It's never exactly what you want. You never do it by, treat, by tweet. Um, <laughs> trade negotiations, as any international agreement, um, have long-term implications. What we've done, first the TPP, then the re renew of NAFTA, uh, then the kerfuffle that now we have with China. You do know that China is not going to relent, right? I know that area quite well. And uh, they will see us out. And while this is happening, markets are closing to us. Relationships get extinguished. Banking fills the void. Infrastructure improvements happen with our competitors. And we have a difficult time getting back into those markets when the next administration fixes this. Um, I expect I'd be involved in that. And, uh, and it's going to be very hard. In the meantime, the consequence is, just had a conversation. On Tuesday night, I meet with six all Republican farmers up in Sioux County and Sioux and Lyon. Uh, they've asked to come see me. They like my technical aspects. I'm, a, I'm an engineer, physics person, business guy, um, and I can talk farming. And I'm learning more every day. It's not the same farming equation as, left 40, as I left 40 years ago. It's been mutated. Uh, it's harder. The, the, uh, the cost benefit analysis, or the cost has, has increased, the benefit has narrowed. Messing with the trade negotiations is a bad move. And we can say the same thing about um, the uh, Affordable Care Act and any number of things which our president has lined out, including, um, including environmental. Um, I do environmental policy with uh, Stimson Institute, Stimson Center, uh, working mostly with water. You do not get rid of the policies that we have with nothing to backfill them. You can always improve, but never abolish uh, when, when you're talking about a progressive society. Shame on us. Trade is a perfect example where we've made some mistakes. 
And I'm afraid that we need to fix these because this is existential for U.S. farmers and the, and the associated small businesses uh, and the businesses that rely on farmers. It is one of the reasons I stand before you. Ma'am? Based on that, um, what are your thoughts about the financial operations, the Well, I mean, you can't just say we're going to get rid of them. I mean, you can't do that. Yeah, oh, so the question had to do with confinements for um, large animals. Yeah, moratorium. Um, I, so I'm not, I'm not entirely privy to this, but you can't just line it out. I mean, you've got people whose lives are associated with this. Yes, they're an ecological problem. Yes, it's an animal rights, animal uh, issues with the, with the animals. I got it. There's, there's, there's a pollution issue. But you can't just throw stuff away uh, because it sounds good. You need to address it and find a long-term solution and start working towards those. Same thing with, with uh, the, the current problem we have with ethanol. Uh, there's some people that want to get rid of ethanol. You can't do that. 62% of our corn grown goes to ethanol, 40-some percent nationwide. You have to find a way to work the ethanol industry so that ethanol itself becomes the byproduct to a larger use of ethanol. Let's make Iowa the place where we grow food farm to table crops and we can change the energy equation associated with ethanol. We can do this. The science is there. We just haven't tried. The science has been around since the 80s. Um, same thing with, with cattle feedlots, confinement lots. I don't like it as any, any better than you, but um, you just can't get rid of them. We need to find a better solution in industry and legislators need to find a better solution along with climate uh, um, uh, ecology experts. I think I have time for one more. Sir. Okay. Uh, my, my question is, do you have any thoughts on the, the, and I'm sure you know about the Navy's plans regarding climate change and what your ideas are about the solutions? Were, were you in the Navy? No. No. Okay, so um, here's a couple of quick little fun facts. United States, the largest user of uh, carbon based fuels. U.S. military, largest producer in the, or user in the United States. The United States Air Force is the largest user of carbon-based fuel. Navy may use the, you may be the one that uses the most DFM, diesel fuel marine, but the, the diesel distillate uh, is also JP5, JP10, those things, and those are, that's the Air Force. Uh, now here's another question. Here's another interesting thing, and, you, and I'm going to say this slow because there's it's, because I'm a wonkish guy. But the Air Force uses 86 percent of their fuel to deliver six percent to the warfighter. It's the delivery charge, and that's because we're lifting lots of fuel to give to a little airplane, uh, and that's that's separate from the logistics, et cetera. So there are efficiencies, yes. Um, I think people welcome the fact that of me running into the Senate. And most, 90% of the people are say, Admiral, I'm the, I'm the most senior military officer to ever run for a congressional seat, just FYI, in the history of our country. It's a sign of the times. Um, but they say, Admiral, happy you're doing that. And it's also a, a measure of being quasi fearful because I've uh, read the book over and over again. So um, yes, uh, the military, just so you know, the Navy has, has had a task force climate change since 2010. Um, the Trump administration abolished it a few months back. The, I don't think it was out of meanness. I want to ascribe it to ignorance. I'm a nice guy. Uh, uh, what, one more, please, ma'am. Oh, student loan debt. 
um, which is greater than what the, the mortgage debt in the United States. Um, it's got to be multi. You can't just erase it. I mean, you can't. Uh, it's not fair to uh, aspects of society. I know everybody wants to say that. I, I disagree with the presidential candidates who say. I think that there's things. A, we don't have. To, the government doesn't have to get rich off it, or it doesn't have to have a profit. That's certainly that, that's the duh in me. I mean, it's a Lutheran in me. Um, higher education is too expensive as it exists today. There are elements that can be taken up in uh, state and local funding and in federal funding that takes some of the burden away. I'm a fan of Pete Buttigieg's, and always have been, of expanding the national service program. And I think in today's environment, especially with the corrosiveness in the political environment, we can do better by letting our young men and women, especially, to expand the horizons a little bit. And, uh, and in doing so, um, cross-pollinate ideas and use their time across their, the various national service to trim down the cost of higher education. Um, and wait a minute, I, I have to talk something about medical, because I'm a big fan of improving our... I, I spent a long time in the military. I had great medical care and great dental care. Now as a retiree, I can go to TRICARE, which is you know government service, and I also do civilian um, work uh, at a civilian entity. That is the medical care that everybody in this country should have, from cradle to grave. Okay. Um, but, uh, all right, so I'm pleased to be able to do this. I think I'm up with time. And, uh, and I thank you for, for being my first audience. And, 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 and thank you for your, uh, your attention to me very much. So, thank you much. Admiral, thank you very much.